Welcome to Ayurveda and Spirituality with your host, Alakananda Ma, a renowned Ayurvedic expert and a graduate of a top London medical school. She is the principal of Alundi Ayurveda Gurukula, a unique apprenticeship style school in Boulder, Colorado. She is a spiritual mother, teacher, flower essence maker, and storyteller. Join us as we uncover the timeless principles of Ayurveda, discover practical tips for enhancing vitality, and explore the deeper dimensions of spirituality that intertwine with the ancient science of life. So welcome everyone, welcome to Satsang. Satsang is a meeting of hearts, a gathering of friends to inquire into the truth. Today we're going to look at spirituality and activism um, and how those two may come together in our lives. It's definitely been a journey for Sadananda and me. I think we've always been involved to the extent of like listening to the BBC World Service or some way like staying in touch with what's going on in the world. But uh, since 2011, um, with the whole situation in Syria, uh, and since, I guess, us being like older, it shifts, we've been much more uh, committed in terms of activism. And it is important to be able to have our activism and our spirituality come together. Um, I usually like to tell a little story about our friend Isabel. They just moved to South Carolina. In fact, when I read that little story, I just did shoot them an email like, hi, missing you. How are you doing in your new life? Just trying to be in touch. Um, but she always loved to come for ceremonies and she'd come in very composed, and very reverent. And that, that was the demeanor we always saw with her. And then we had an election watch night at the co-op. This was a long while ago. This is when we were really, really hoping that Bush wouldn't get elected the second time when we were all gathering for an election watch. And she sort of comes in all jaunty, chewing gum. Uh, she's in a totally different personality <laughs> aspect, not not like dis dissociative, <laughs> not like that. We all have different sub-personalities. Yeah. Like the story I tell about mum, she'd be mum. But when I, then when I go with her to the infant welfare clinic, Suddenly she'd walk into the room and she'd be Dr. Board and not mum. <laughs> be completely different. It was like that. She was just like in another aspect of her nature because it's difficult. Uh, because spiritually, spirituality and activism don't seem to mix. And I would like to start this talk with a story from the cradle of civilization, uh, from what is now Iraq, from Baghdad, which used to be, in its day, the greatest city in the world, the greatest center, center of culture, learning, piety, mysticism, the most impressive city. And in that wonderful city, there was a great Sufi, not a famous one like Rumi and some of the uh, Persian ones are to this day. We, we've pretty much missed out on Shibli. Um, and after he passed away, he appeared to one of his disciples in a dream. And in the dream, he told the disciple about the conversation he had with Allah after he died. And Allah said, do you know why I've had mercy on you? And Shibli said, uh, because I profess la ilaha illallah, there's no God but God. Nope. Uh, because my whole life I prayed five times a day. Nope. That's not it. Uh, because I always fasted on Ramadan? No. Nope. Because I made the arduous pilgrimage all the way to Mecca? No. Nope. <laughs> Why did you have mercy on me? Shibli, do you remember one very cold night in Baghdad and you were out walking? And you saw a little stray kitten sitting on a wall shivering. And you picked up the little kitten and you sheltered the kitten under your fur coat. That is why I've had mercy on you. So that's really a story of spirituality and activism. He was one of the greatest 
he was the greatest saint of Baghdad, but he, God had mercy on him, not because of all his piety and his following of the five pillars and all his religious things, but because he was kind and saved the life of a little cold kitten. <laughs> he didn't have to start an animal shelter. He didn't have to start the ASPCA of the Abbasid Empire. He just had to do something for the little being right in front of him. And there's a really uh, story, related story in the gospel. Uh, and it's the, the story of the sheep and the goats. Like everyone's been lined up in this culture. Sheep are greatly favored over goats. Dad always used to say, sheep are our totem. I, uh, I'm a sheep person. I'm Jewish means I'm a, I'm a person of sheep. The sheep were highly prized, the goats less so. So the sheep and the goats are all lined up. And the sheep are going to go and graze by the brook of Kidron, where it's very, I've been to these places, where it's really nice and green and lush, and they have very nice pastures. And the poor goats get to go graze in Gehenna, which doesn't mean hell. It means where the rubbish fires never stop burning and all the comp smelly compost piles are. So the worms are always eating away at the compost piles and it's, it's more rough and it's not a nice, the steeper slope. It's not a nice pasture. It's the stinky, smelly rubbish fireplace. Um, that's where the goats have to go and graze. So uh, Jesus says to the uh, sheep, um, do you know why you're in this, this line on the sheep side? They say, no, we don't know. He says, because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick and when I was in prison, you visited me. And they said, we never saw you hungry and fed you. We never gave you any water. We never did any of those things. And he said, ah. As much as you did this to the little people, the poor, the vulnerable, the forgotten people, you did it for me. That's why you get to go have those nice Kidron pastures. And then he says to the goats, do you know why you got to be in this line and have to go uh, on the steep slope to the stinky, smelly pastures? No. Because when I was hungry, you didn't give me anything to eat. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. When I was naked, you gave me no clothes. When I was sick, you never visited me. And they said, when did we ever see you hungry and not feed you, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, because you didn't do it for other people. You didn't do it for the poor. You didn't do it for the forgotten. You didn't do it for the vulnerable. You didn't do it for me. Off you go. Have the bad postures. So that that kind of really gives an idea that it it's so important what we do, our actions, and how we relate to our fellow people, be they kittens or be they what Jesus called the least of these my brothers and sisters. So we're not going to exactly use a four worlds or four ages framework today, but we're going to use the framework of Kabbalah. Where we had the four worlds with the Yotei Vav Hey. I forgot to put that sign up. But other times we've used that, we've started at the bottom, at the lower Hey, and we've ascended through the worlds. And today, we uh, to do spirituality and activism, you have to start at the top. And it's the descending energy as we draw the spirit into the world. That's the Passover is coming up soon-ish. It's a leap year, so it's not that soon, but soon-ish. It's just really soon, but it's, they didn't have the leap year. Passover is coming up, and on Passover, it's the same thing. You start off with, with the Kiddush in the world of absolute 
and you slowly just send the energy down so at the end you're ready to be empowered and go out in the world so this this is how the consideration of spirituality and activism so this is like very much always been a di divide on the one hand you've got the me and my dafu people uh, why why are you wasting your time like listening to the news <laughs> just like that's like such a waste of time and uh, getting involved in politics and all that stuff you should put that time into meditating the world is messed up was messed up it'll always be messed up just got to get out of it if we're lucky we're going to get out of it so we can benefit all beings um but let's just get out of it and on the other hand you've got all the activists who are really really caught up in their activism they don't have any time for self-reflection they're just like deep into their activism um so i as i've told you many times i've been an activist as long as i can remember actually my very first uh political experience was when I was six and there had just been a revolution in Hungary. They had tried to get rid of the communist regime. Uh, they tried to get rid of the communist regime and they failed. So then they had to flee. So in uh, there were a bunch of Hungarian refugees that had made it to the UK so my dad had a little like co collecting tin back in those days you could go door to door and collect money and he and i went around door to door raising money for the hungarian revolutionaries who'd escaped uh from uh and uh that was my first experience that you put your time and energy into doing things in the political world for other people one of those hungarian refugees later was the surgeon i worked under <laughs> Dr. Ben, the absolutely brilliant surgeon that i've talked about so often <laughs> was one of the people we were raising money for <laughs> all that time back um later when we were in ipswich i uh, made friends with some quakers uh um there were twins twin girls and the twin girls and i got involved in activism and you've heard this story before too it protesting the vietnam war in britain was not really a thing <laughs> uh it wasn't like anyone was being drafted it wasn't like we were bombing everyone although we had yeah, living in Ipswich, we had at that time, we still had the Bentwaters Air Base with the, the longest runway in the world. And the B 52 bombers were flying over our head every day, which made it hard not to remember the war in Vietnam. So, anyway, on uh, must have probably, I don't know which day it was, if it was November 11th, I don't remember it being that cold, but me and the two Quaker girls went down to the cenotaph in Christchurch Park and did a three girl protest against the Vietnam War <laughs> while other people in America were having massive protests and getting caught by the police we three girls were doing that we did I got a bunch of classmates and we did a protest on this uh, on Corn Hill on the steps of the of the corn exchange we got moved on by the police my parents were very proud that their daughter got moved on by the police because we didn't have a permit we were sitting there knitting uh, we were yeah suddenly i'm just like what you knitted we did knit squares and uh, we fasted uh, because other people were hungry and we knitted squares because other people were cold and that was our protest that we teenagers could think of until we got moved on by the police um and 
uh, we also uh, went to London to lobby for overseas development aid. We didn't understand at that time the ramifications of the strings that are attached to the development aid, but we thought poor people in Africa, in India, should have more money from rich countries. So I've always been involved in, in this kind of thing. Um, but there's there's always this like tension between the activist people and the you know, Maizafu people. So we ha we have to get past this dichotomy, um, which is something, it's new, but it's not really new because all the founders of all the religions were radical. But later, when the religions become established, they become the establishment until the next radical comes along. Abraham was radical. He had to leave his country because his vision of reality was so radical. He had to go to a new land and start over. Moses was a radical. He was bringing freedom to enslaved tribes and having a nonviolent revolution <laughs> like Martin Luther King and getting the people free. Uh, and Krishna was very, very radical. Uh, remember, in, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says the definition of the true yogi is lokas and graha, about the welfare of the, they are rati. They have orgasmic bliss about the welfare of the whole. That's their biggest concern, is the welfare of all beings. And Bhagavad Gita is a very radical book. And because in Bhagavad Gita, it says women and untouchables can also attain by the path that I teach. And the Hebrew prophets, incredibly radical. God does not need the blood of bulls and goats. He needs your humble and broken heart. He needs you to care about people, not just go and do rituals and then oppress people. Jesus was very radical. He says, uh, go forth. Don't have two coats. Don't bring a packed lunch. Don't have any shoes. Just go and spread the good news. So when we come to bring spirituality and activism together, the fact is... Was, okay, say something, darling, but say it loudly so they can hear you. <laughs> well, he left his, his kingdom and all his uh, wealth, very wealthy kingdom in the French, and became uh, a bhikkhu, right? A beggar? He, and, and he, you know, practiced, dedicated his life to uh, yoga. Uh huh. And he pursued a truth. Uh huh. So he was he was very all. So it all starts always starts off with a radical, and then it becomes institutionalized. So the beginning of bringing spirituality and activism together means we have to have a spiritual practice, <laughs> because we can't play Bach if we don't do the scales and arpeggios. We we in order to do this it has to start off where you actually have a spiritual practice uh, it starts off with atsilut starts off with the yod starts off with the spiritual world you we have to be in touch with the spiritual world it means we we start our day in that way connecting connecting with the breath Connecting with Atsilut. We start our day a little bit that way. Um, when I was, uh, I had 
been sent home because, from India because I was sick and I was in the UK for a little while and then I came back to India and <laughs> had to somehow find Sananda, which I succeeded at doing. It was really hard. Um, I found it. I found him on the banks of the Ganges. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, while I was there, I can I connected with the Peace Center, and that was the time I've been telling you about this other times, where everyone was really angry about the U.S. bases having the cruise missiles. There are a lot of U.S. bases in Britain, and especially in East Anglia. My parents would always always say, we're an occupied country if you've got these bases. Um, they put cruise missiles in these bases, but no one, none of the British people really wanted them because they just thought we shouldn't house weapons of mass destruction. And we shouldn't think in that way. You destroy me, we'll destroy you. We shouldn't do it that way. So the group of us at the Peace Center decided to do an action. We were going to do civil disobedience and we were going to block the main road, London Road, for four minutes. The reason for the choice of four minutes was because, unlike in the United States, in the UK, if there was going to be an attack from the Soviet Union, like a nuclear attack, you'd get four minutes warning. That's why we never had civil defense drills. You can't do anything in four minutes. <laughs> uh, also because civil defense drills are useless. All, all they do is traumatize you. But we would have four minutes warning of annihilation. In, enough time to kiss your loved ones goodbye, I guess. Um, so everyone knew that. So we were going to block London Road for four minutes. I wasn't going to do the civil disobedience. So I was one of the ones that was passing out literature and explaining to people why we were blocking the road for four minutes. But in doing this protest, even though a lot of them were in a little meditation group for young moms that I had started, People hadn't checked checked in with Atsilut for this protest. So everyone's at this protest, they're rah, rah, and they're angry, and they're lying down on London Road, and the cars are, the people in the cars are angry, and the cars are beeping, and the policemen are there. They weren't American police. The policemen were like, why are you doing this? I said, we're lying down there for four minutes. And he said, oh, because we got four minutes. And I'm like, right, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be out of here in two minutes from now. So don't worry. I, I didn't feel comfortable with this protest because it was creating more anger in the world. Because people were angry at being held up for four minutes when they were trying to go to work or maybe to the doctor or maybe someone was going into labor or whatever was happening. I, I, I just, I realized it wasn't something that I really wanted to do, uh, to, to be involved in all that like emotions and anger and all these hippies blocking the road. So, I, I learned something from doing that, which is, that's not really, that's not my style. Um, making making people, ang making people who are not decision makers angry wasn't what I wanted to do. I'm not saying it's wrong. It might be the only thing you have to do, but it didn't fit for me. So how, how can we be someone that's connected with this with the spiritual world and be an activist. There's a couple of great examples. One is the late great Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, who was a monk from Vietnam, and really emanated peace, uh, and had lived through the horrors of the Vietnam War. And the other 
really amazing person is the Cambodian monk Mahagoshananda, and you should try his book Step by Step, Meditations on Wisdom and Compassion. He, was, he lived through the Khmer Rouge and his entire family was murdered. And he brings such peacefulness. And then, uh, Gorchen Rinpoche! We just watched a uh, documentary biography of Gorchen Rinpoche. Someone who was tortured in Chinese prison for 20 years because he actually was part of the calm resistance fighters that were trained by the CIA to resist the Chinese invasion, even though he was already a high lama, but he was a young man. He was starved, he was tortured, and eventually he came out, but his whole thing is all beings benefit. That there isn't a line on his face that's anything other than kindness. He isn't angry with anyone. His Holy List, the Dalai Lama, isn't angry with anyone. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, had to flee his country. Appalling things have happened in Tibet. Just, just a horrendous destruction of the people and the culture. And yet he believes in basic goodness. So then we come down into Bariya. That's the, the world of the mind. That what, what is the conceptual frame by which we can approach doing activism in a spiritual way? We have to have a change of mind. And it's a change of mind that is very difficult in America, it seems like. And, and I know that in this group, uh, a number of us didn't grow up in America all the time um, and or weren't born in America or in Mashika's case, grew up a lot of time in other countries. And um, But it seems like in America being such a big country, it's, it's a thought that first of all, I'm the most important, secondly, my fellow Americans. Because I, I remember at the time of the war in Afghanistan hearing this word, American lives. And this was completely an alien concept to me. I had never been raised to think that there were British lives or American lives. Or... I just always thought there were human lives. Not this kind of life that's better, more valuable than someone else's kind of life. So, so part of being in Berea is to, to understand that everyone is important, that the people in the refugee camps in Chad who've had to flee from Sudan are just as important, just as valuable as we are, that the people in Congo fleeing from Goma because they're, they're being attacked with the um, conflict in Congo, they're just as important as we are. That the Rohingya people who nobody wants are just as important as we are. That the Uyghur people, the last time I gave this talk, um, a Uyghur friend came the next week and gave a little talk about the Uyghur. The Uyghur people who were being genocided by the Chinese and nobody's saying anything because China's like the world's second biggest economy and we need them are just as important as we are. So that's like a really, really huge change we 
in our conceptual frame is to, just to understand that everyone is precious and everyone is valuable. The other really important conceptual shift that came uh, was really, really taught by Mahavoshananda and by Thich Nhat Hanh is non-partisan. That's really amazing to think that after what they suffered from the other side in these wars, that they would come with this idea that we must be non-partisan. But that's that that that's really, really important that we are able to appreciate all people without an us and them. Not, not only the the one change is it's not a case that I'm more important than other people or people in my religion or my country are more important than other people. But the other one is it's not an us and them. We have to overcome the us and them, not have the bee wars where we protect everyone in my hive, but we can destroy other hives. We have to, we want to come beyond the us and them. Um, So I don't know if you all have heard of Danny Pearl because it was quite a long while ago, but he was a journalist for the Wall Street Journal and he was kidnapped in Karachi and he was horribly murdered and they made him make a, like a pleading video before he was murdered. It was a, they showed his whole, it was just absolutely dreadful. Um, and it, I, I couldn't sleep for nights on end thinking what happened to Danny Pearl. And then I thought, what would I do if that was me? And I had to make a video. And I was like, I will go on that video and I will say we must believe that all human beings are basically good. And let that be my last words. That doesn't mean, Sarah, that the things they do are good. When we believe that all human beings are basic good, we mean they're endowed. We're all endowed with that basic goodness that gives us the opportunity to do good in the world. It doesn't mean, oh, they did these terrible things, but you know, we know that basically. It doesn't mean that at all. They're, but I'm sure the Dalai Lama didn't mean that. His his own father was murdered by the like corruption of Tibetan politics, and then his entire people were so many like millions of Tibetans were killed by the Chinese. He doesn't think doing that is good. It, it's it's at a deeper level. Is that fit with you okay? Yep. That that's what we mean. So that that was kind of my plan. If I'm going to be killed by, by the terror, just was so terrifying. What happened to Danny Pearl? If I'm going to be killed like that, that's what I'm going to do. Who knows if I could do it? Um. There's also this Bob Dylan song, Masters of War. And in the last verse, he says, I hope that you die and your death will come soon and I'm going to follow your casket in the pale afternoon. And it's going to stand over the casket and make sure that you're that he's dead. It's not that we should wish anyone dead. We don't want to wish any harm to anyone, even to the most evil people. And we've talked about this together too. It's not. It's not about... People should receive the proper um, consequences for their actions. When people don't receive the proper consequences for their actions, more and more and more things go wrong in the world. This is about how we work with our own mind, that we don't want to wish evil on anyone. We, we wish them to have that change of heart. But to, to me, and I think maybe to sudden under this, this casket that's going to be followed is is the is the paradigm of 
domination. You got the lyrics right here, I know. Do you say them then, darling? <laughs> I, <laughs> I hope that you'll die and your death will come soon. Yeah, I'll probably be back to you. You know, I'll stand over your body while you go down. Um, I can't remember myself. Well, the, those two lines were right, at least. Well, we'll have to go through the whole thing later because we have the Dylan book. Um, it's it's being radicalized to the point that also that we do not become the oppressor by our silence. This is something that Martin Luther King said. This is what uh, Pastor Nimola said. I think everyone knows about what Pastor Nimola says. They they came for the Jews, but I said nothing because I wasn't Jewish. And then they came for the trade unionist, and I said nothing because I wasn't a trade unionist. And then they came for the Catholics, but I still said nothing because after all, I was a Protestant. And then they came for me, and there was nobody left to say anything because. They had all been taken. So it, it it it's being able to to stand up and be counted because the you know like we talked we talked about alone in Berlin a lot. The son was killed. The Jewish neighbor killed herself to avoid the fate she saw was coming to her. And they got up and they did something and they they did everything they could. And you might have said they failed. But when they were hanged, they were their soul was intact. So every single one of us, we all breathe the same air. I know it's scary to think about, but Hitler breathed the same air. Mao Zedong breathed the same air. We all, St. Francis breathed the same air. Baltem Tov breathed the same air. We all breathe the same air. All breathe the same air. All we're, the animals, we all breathe the same air. We're really all. In, in that way, we're all one. I think it's a good, it's 10 till. So we'll have to serialize this. We've got as far as Berea. So we, we've looked at how there can be a dichotomy between spirituality and activism. And it sure can be fine when you're young that you may decide before before anything else, I need to put my energy into spirituality and get grounded in that. Um, that's absolutely fine because after all, we've got our whole lives. Uh, our our path unwinds and unfolds for us in a in a should unfold in some kind of natural way. But it does mean to be someone that has spirituality and activism together that we do whatever it takes to be grounded in our spirituality first and foremost then to change our minds in these very important ways to understand that other people are important. I mean, that's that's when the famous words of Neville Chamberlain, when Hitler invaded Sudetenland, which is part of Czechoslovakia, and Neville Chamberlain, the, who was the British Prime Minister at the time, really didn't want to have to go to war. And, and he said, uh, we should not concern ourselves about events that happen in a faraway country of which we know little. <laughs> that's, that's truly what he said. And they didn't do anything to protect the Czech people and all that happened in Sudetenland. So then Hitler invades Poland. Because he's like, oh, I can do whatever I want. I I took Sudetenland, nobody did anything. Now Poland, and 
Hitler and Stalin come with a pincer action and they invade Poland uh, from the east and from the west. And Britain was allies with Poland. So then Neville Chamberlain had to come and say, I'm uh, sorry to inform you that our nation is now at war. Because you couldn't, you couldn't get away from it then, but things got to the point they got to. And the people in Poland suffered so atrociously, partly because of the attitude of we don't need to concern ourselves with things that occur in a faraway country of which we know little. And the world is bigger now. Faraway countries of which we know little might be in Africa. When I was little, Timbuktu, I didn't know it was a real place. I just knew that it was a word you said when you meant a faraway place that you don't know anything about and will never go to. <laughs> I'm not going to Timbuktu, but now we know what's going on in Mali. Well, we should care about what's going on in Mali and we should care about the Tuareg and their struggle. Um, we should care about the people who are trying to preserve their culture from being destroyed by these radical Islamists. We need to care about everyone in the whole world equally. And the other part is the non-partisan, which is really, really hard to do. But we have these great examples like Thich Nhat Hanh and Mahagoshananda and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And seeing Gautam Rinpoche in Taiwan giving the highest initiations to people who are by their ethnicity Chinese. That was very impressive. Yeah, I know they weren't part, they had already gotten a, broken away from China, but you saw in the film, right? Mm. He's he's initiating all these people in Taiwan and he's not like, I don't like Chinese people. They tortured me for uh, 20 years. We his also- body, His body is in complete pain all the time. He can hardly open his eyes because of the uh, after effects of the torture. Yep. And he's still, he's always happy. He's always happy and laughing. They also give him <laughs> empowerment and kind of leading their faith in the Yeah. And his, his, uh, his, his Jew Jewish devotees brought him to the Wailing Wall, too, to the Western Wall, and he's like mm -hmm. twirling his. <laughs> His prayer wheel, and there was he has he has a kippah on, and he's running his prayer wheel at the Western Wall, and we were like, "Oh my God!" So yeah, we we have we have people who inspire us. We may not be able to do this yet ourselves to really reach that nonpartisan place, but we have people who to inspire us who have suffered so much, and yet. Due to starting at the spiritual platform, they have been able to have this universal view. So, yep, we'll, we'll be continuing on next week, looking as we come into Yatsira, the world of feelings, and then into Asiya, the world of action. Did anyone have any questions or comments or uh, issues? <laughs> Uh, to this point. Thank you for tuning in to Ayurveda and Spirituality with Alakananda Ma. We hope today's exploration has ignited a spark of curiosity and insight within you. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave us a five-star review and share it with a friend. For more enlightening discussions and practical wisdom on Ayurveda and spirituality, subscribe and join our Facebook group, Alundi Ayurveda. To allow us to continue sharing valuable content, consider donating to Alundi Ashram. The links will be in the show notes. Until next time, may you walk the path of Ayurveda with grace and embrace the light of spiritual wisdom in your journey. Sukantim Pushtiva